Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, we, we just regressed. Pretty whoever was back, that was very emphatic. Thank you, whoever that was. I appreciate that. But uh, that, we were kind of on your own. But uh, thanks for trying. Uh, well, good, good to be back with you uh, tonight. It's, uh, again, it's been great being with you all in these days and, and uh, talking through uh, what God has to say to us about the issue of relationships and, and just being reminded that when, uh, when we start talking about revival and saying, you know, God, you know, what do you want to do in my life? A lot of times it just starts with the people that I do life with uh, right around me. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, we're in the middle of this too. And I, I, you know, I hope that the one thing that uh, we've tried to communicate throughout this is that, uh, that we're just, we're normal people. We're, we're learning as we go. We don't have this all together. Somebody asked me tonight, they said, uh, did you get squeezed today? And I said, I said, yes. And I said, so I said, the, the good news is that, that Jimmy didn't come out. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure Jesus came out, but it, but it wasn't Jimmy, so, it's not, so that's progress, okay, so I'm getting there, but uh, uh, we're, we're working through this stuff too, and uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've shared some of these principles, and, and as I'm saying it, it's, uh, I feel the, the Holy Spirit tap me on the shoulder and say, uh, Jimmy, did you hear what you just said? Because I was at your house earlier, and uh, you know, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going through this as well, but um, a while back, uh, you know, just in an effort to, to follow some of these principles, my, my wife got me this card, and I thought this was nice. It says, I love you more today than yesterday. And it's just, yeah, isn't that sweet? And then I opened it up, it says, yesterday you really got on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, we laugh at that, but you know what? <laughs> That's a reality, and so... Uh, often, more often than not, and then, so uh, uh, we're in this too. We're learning, we're growing, and, and we want to see. Uh, we want to. We want to see God enable us, help us by His grace to make Him look good to the people around us by how we do life together. So let's again have a, another word of prayer as we get things started, and we'll just jump in here. Father, thank you so much for uh, again the privilege of coming together um, uh, in, under Your Word. And uh, thank you for the, the power of your word and how you use it um, to, 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 uh, to divide and to, um, to separate and to, to uh, expose the, the truth uh, that's in our hearts and how you use it to encourage us, to challenge us, and uh, help us to grow and to become more and more like Jesus. That, that's our, our goal and our prayer, Father, that we would just be able to follow, we would abide, like Steve said last night, We'd acknowledge our need for you and the God that we would obey. Um, and so we ask for your grace to enable us to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we talked Sunday night about the purpose of relationships. And that is to make God look good uh, through our relationships. And that God wants to use our relationships to shape us and mold us. Tonight, uh, I'm sorry, on, on Monday night we talked about the first step in that process. And that's uh, of, of loving one another. The way Jesus has shown his love to us. And last night we talked about the issue of respect and uh, showing honor to one another. Outdoing one another is showing honor. And uh, so tonight we're going to take another look at a, another um, step in this process. And, and we're going to call this, uh, for lack of a better term, the God's design for the family. So we're going to turn to page 47. We're going to talk about God's design for the family. This will be a little more family-centric tonight. And uh, just look at what God has to say about this. So, um, if you see it here on the, on the board, we have a, 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 an organizational chart, okay, or a, a flow chart. It's a, a, a lot of organizations, businesses uh, have these kinds of. I, I imagine your church has something similar, where uh, it's just a, a way of um, uh, helping define and, and help things run more effectively and efficiently, knowing who answers to whom and, and how I get things taken care of. And it's just it's just a way to help us function and operate more effectively. Well, I, I believe God's given us a, a design, a flow chart for the family. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. It says this. It says, the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. There's a flow chart that God's given. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, uh, as we line up our lives underneath the, the organization of God's word and God's truth and his principles... It, it, just, it just helps us to become more effective and efficient and, and, and uh, uh, effective at, at doing what God's called us to do, making Him look good. 
So we want to we talk tonight about how do we do this? What does it look like to, um, to um, line up under God's plan? How does following God's plan help us accomplish His purpose of making it, the, Him look good? So what I want to do is break it down into, just into basically two legs tonight. Okay, two things. First, we're going to talk to the ladies about what your role is in this. And then, guys, I'm going to talk to you about uh, us and our role and what God has for us. Uh, with regard to this. So, um, uh, as I'm talking to the ladies, I want my, my wife, I'm asking her to come up here and help me with this. Because uh, one thing I found is when I talk about these kinds of things, anything I say can and will be used against me. And so, she's going to help me stay on track. Yeah, exactly. So, um, is your mic on? Okay, because I didn't hear you talking. No. No, no. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Just you know. Yeah, you announce your presence. Yeah, way to go. Okay. So the first uh, part of this is is to ladies. Ladies, what's your role in this? And it, and it's I think we can sum it up like this. It's to create a submissive atmosphere. Create a submissive atmosphere in your home. Now, as soon as I say submissive, all right, there's probably many of you who just kind of like. You know, you bristle at that and are like, uh, hold on a second, you know, where are, you, where are we going? Because I've heard this sermon before. And, and uh, before we go there, I just want to say, we're gonna, we want to clearly define what Scripture says about submission. I, I think our culture, even, even our Christian culture, has, has really uh, distorted what true biblical submission looks like. And so we're going we're gonna to dive in and unpack this. And, and, and really kind of define it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to define it, what submission is not. Okay, the first thing that submission is not, it is not inferiority. And, and again, I think that's been uh, misconstrued a lot of times. It's, it's not about inequality. It's not a, it's not a value statement. It's just about roles and responsibilities and, and how we function together. So, so it's not an issue of inferiority. Um, the second thing submission is not. It's not surrendering your identity or your personality. So, um, I, I have a personality. I'm very driven, and I'm, I'm pretty strong, type A, for those of you who know what that means. And so when I hear about submission, I kind of thought that I had to change my personality. My best friend over here, she's just this sweet, passive, you know what I'm saying, like that type of personality. I thought that's what submission looked like, and I didn't understand that it wasn't about my personality as much as uh, it's a hard issue. Right. Um, I, I don't want Lori to change her, her, her personality. Okay, I, I married her for who, who she is. Uh, we complement each other. If she wasn't who she was, I, I, would, I would be a mess. Okay, I'm a mess anyway. But, but uh, I need her to be who she is. So I don't want her to change that. It also doesn't mean a lack of influence. Again, I kind of had this image of what it looked like. And it was like this wife that husband came home and he said this is what we're doing and she'd say yes sir and not really have any input and I thought well that's not going to happen uh, but that's not what it is either no, it, that's not what it is and that's not how it would happen but anyway um, uh, no I, I, again, again I need Lori's influence and, and uh, you know, we've, we've got to work together so submission does not mean you can't speak up and say you know what you think and that we're not working together this is, this is a team thing in, uh, back in Genesis where uh, you we know, have the creation account, and it says that, that um, uh, God made man, and it was not good, man should be alone. It says that God made a helper. That word helper in the Hebrew comes from two different Hebrew words. The, the first one means um, to help. It's the, actually the same word that's used for God in the Psalms. My help comes from the Lord. Okay? And so so the, as the psalmist looked to God for help, God said, I'm going to give you somebody who's going to help you. So the first word is, is help. The other, the other word means uh, one who stands in front of or opposite to. So God said, I'm going to, you know, Adam, you're, you're going to be in trouble on your own. So I'm going to make you uh, somebody to go with you that's going to compliment. It's going to, going to help you, but also it's going to, at times going to say, hey, hold on a second. Watch out where you're going. And, and so I, I need her influence. Um, we talked uh, last night about one of the benefits of being a guy is, you know, that, you know, gray hair, wrinkles, only adds character, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm, you know, I don't have a whole lot of options anymore, and I actually, 
I, I love my haircut. Okay, some you know some people give me a hard time. I, I, I love it because one, I can give myself my own haircut. It's cheap, and uh, you know, and two, I, I get out of the shower, my hair's already done. You know, I don't have to look in front of the mirror like you know Steve and Pastor Eric and these guys. You know, so I, you know, it's great. I love it. But the problem with giving myself my own haircut is I can't always see the back of my head. So I can't ever see the back of my head. But uh, I don't always know what's going on back there. So, so one day, I, I, I cut my hair, and I was, I was getting ready to leave the, the house, and right before I did, Lori stopped me, and uh, I, if you can't see, there's this strip right down the middle, I was totally this, you know, now if, if Lori were just that, you know, quiet and passive, and you know, I'll speak when I'm spoken to kind of person, I, I'd have walked out the door looking like an idiot, you know, or more of an idiot than I already am, and so, uh, unfortunately, she stopped me and said, hang on a second. Of course, she had to take a picture first, but uh, uh, she said, hold on a second, and, and stop me, call me, and, and I need that. Now, we, we laugh about the haircut, but there's a lot of other areas. You know, when we were raising our voice, there's a lot of times that Lori would say, you know, I, I think one of the boys is really struggling right now. I think there's some stuff going on, you know, emotionally. And, it, you know, as a guy, half the time, I'm like, really, you know what? I, you know, I had no idea. And I, I needed her to speak into my life and, and help me with those kinds of things. So again, it's not a lack of influence. And, and then the last thing, submission is not. It does not mean that the husband is always right. This is a very important point, so make sure you write that down. There, yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure they get this one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I tell Jenny, because um, we, we have to submit to one another who you're working for. It's not just your husband. It, it, it just is like all day long. And so I told him, I actually, even though I have a strong persona, I actually don't struggle that much with submitting as long as I think that that person's making the right choice. <laughs> That's not really the submission. I'm just saying that that makes it a whole lot okay, easier. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you about, years ago, Jimmy uh, um, had to make a decision about, just a financial decision that kind of affected our family and um, affected our, us monthly. And so, Jimmy wanted option A, I wanted option B, option B being the correct way to do it. <clears throat> and so um, every month this happened and I would go to him and I'd say, Jimmy, I need you. And so I thought, I just different ways of trying to help him understand, you know, this is the right way to do it. And it was always ended with, I just really think we need to do it this way. And so I would be like, fine. And then... Hold on, hold on. So when a woman says fine, what that really means is, you go ahead and do that, let's see how that works. So. <laughs> I'm just going to go on. Um, so, so I obeyed on the outside, but inside, I was dealing with some major frustration and anger, and this was not something that went on for a couple of weeks. We're talking a very, very long time that, that this was a battle for us. And so I started praying, and I was like, God, I need you. I should have just stopped there, but I didn't. <laughs> I said, I need you to help Jimmy see the light. It's not good anyway. And you guys can laugh, but I was serious because I was so frustrated that he wasn't doing what I thought he should do. And um, so a friend of mine said, Lord, I think you should start praying that maybe God would change your heart. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll do that. And I really didn't think much of it until I started doing it. And almost immediately, God graciously showed me what, how I was seeing it. See, I am a, by nature. I look out and I'm a problem solver and everything, so I'm looking at the problem and I've got the solution if you would just listen. Does that make sense? And so, um, if someone had asked me, do you believe that God is sovereign? I would say, absolutely, without a doubt. But everything I was doing, all the choices I was making, the things I was saying, did not show that because I still had a need to control this. And so it all became about Jimmy's decision making and not really just trusting God. So, that's a picture of what submission is not. So we want to define what submission is according to Scripture. So, if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, I will go look here and see what God's Word has to say uh, about this. 1 Peter 3, starting in, in verse 1. It says, Likewise, wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the Word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. So, what does submission, what does biblical submission really look like? First, it's just putting yourself in a place of protection. Um, going back to that, uh, that diagram in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the, the, you know, as, the, as the, the, the wife lines herself up under her husband, the husband, as a husband, I'm, I'm responsible to Christ, and, and I have to answer to him about the decisions of my family. We're going to look at that here in a minute, guys. And, and so uh, you can kind of put it this way, that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, like what I said, putting yourself in a place of protection. I heard a, a lady one time say, submission is ducking so God can plaster your husband. And then, I think there's some truth to that, because there's sometimes when, when, honestly, ladies, God's trying to get our attention, and we can't hear him because all we can hear is you. And, and sometimes it, the best thing you can do is to, to uh, just uh, allow God to, to speak to that. Okay? The next thing the submission is, we see this, this passage is, it's the most powerful tool a wife has to win the non-believing husband to Christ. Um, there are some of you ladies in here tonight that I, I'm sure your husbands are, are, not, are not believers. And, and they, 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 don't, they don't buy into this church thing. And you're on your own. And the spiritual leadership of your family. Some of you, who maybe your husband is, and he, you know, he claims to be a follower, but and he's here, but you know his life, and you know what's not adding up. The best thing you can do for your husband is not try to convince him and not try to convert him. The best thing you can do is allow him to see the life of Christ lived out through you. This is this is what God's words say: be an influence, be an example. Uh, not by word, but, but by your by deed. It's also just choosing to line up under your husband's leadership. It is a choice. It's a choice. In a, I want to go back to this um, in the verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. It says likewise. Likewise. So whenever you see the word likewise or therefore, what that's saying is this is in conjunction with what the author was just talking about. So Peter was just in the passage before this talking about Jesus. And how Jesus submitted himself to his father's authority and, and, uh, and then submitted himself even to, to earthly men and how they, um, uh, what they did to him here on this earth. And says, says why? In other words, when you uh, create this submissive atmosphere in your home, you're painting a picture uh, of Jesus like no other. And just as Jesus chose to line himself up, under his a father's authority, you doing the same paints, paints a picture of Christ to your children and to others who are watching. And it's an act of faith. Um, the last part of this passage says this: that um, for this is how the the whole excuse me, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. Their hope was not in their themselves or what they could do. Their hope was, um, it, they put their faith and trust in God. God loves to be trusted. Um, when I was talking later, earlier about our disagreement, it was not where I finally saw where Jimmy was coming from and everything was okay. I actually still thought he was wrong. Uh, but I had to choose to act on my faith and trust that God was sovereign. Um, that's an that's a incredibly important point, that God loves to be trusted. Um, I heard somebody say this one time. If you're putting your hope for happiness in the hands of any other person, any other human, you are guaranteeing disappointment. And, and sometimes we look to one another. This is not just uh, well, for the ladies. Guys, we do this too. We look to one another for our hope and satisfaction and, and, uh, and joy. And when that person, because uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a broken person, okay? Um, uh, Paul Tripp says this, that the, the essence of all relationships is, is a broken person living with another broken person in a fallen world. That's, that's the reality. And if Lori's looking to me to make the right decisions and do the right thing, she's guaranteeing disappointment because I'm going to fail at some point or another. So, that's the picture, ladies, for you. Thank you, babe. Appreciate your help. Uh, that's the picture for the ladies, is to create that submissive atmosphere. Now, guys, I want to talk to you. What, what does this mean for us as men uh, to line ourselves up this way? The first thing is we need to love sacrificially. 
love sacrificially. Now, I want to, I want to back up and, uh, before I dive into this too far. It's Ephesians chapter 5, where uh, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about husbands loving your wives and, and wives uh, respecting and honoring your husbands. The beginning of that chapter says, submit yourselves one to another. And we talk about submission as, as husband, it, it, it works its way out in, that, in love. We talked about that extensively on Monday. What does it look for, like for us to love our wives, to love our families the way Jesus did? To lay down our lives, to yield our rights, to be a servant, those kinds of things. So we're not going to go in, back into that because that's, that's, uh, we covered that on Monday. But the second thing for us as guys is this, we need to lead spiritually. Now, ladies, I want you to understand something. When, when I say, you know, that God wants to, you, know, you to create a submissive atmosphere in your home, and that kind of makes you go, hold on a second, you know, and, and it causes some anger. When I tell men you need to lead spiritually, that creates a lot of anxiety in most of us as men. Mo most of the men I know do not feel adequately equipped to be the spiritual leader in their home. Mostly because we know what's really going on inside our own heart and life. You know, who am I to, you know, try to lead this family? I can't, I can barely, you know, take care of my own life. And, and, and spiritual leadership as, as men can be a daunting thing. It can be something that can be kind of concerning to us. Um, before we dive into what it really means to be a spiritual leader, though, I want to look at a, a, a passage of Scripture. We won't take time to turn there because you're all probably, probably very familiar with it. But again, it's back to the creation account. And, and, and God creates all, all the things we know about uh, the earth and creation. He creates man. He places man in the garden. And he, and he says to the man, Here, here's, here's some things I want you to do. And here's, here's the one rule, okay? It was a one rule garden. It wouldn't have to be a great place to live, wouldn't it? Okay? You can eat anything in here. Everything here is for your enjoyment, except for one tree. Don't, don't eat from that tree over there, okay? Yeah, that's, your, that's your rule. And so we know that the situation, that, that the, 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 the serpent comes to, to Eve and, and deceives her, and, and, uh, and she takes the fruit. And, and listen to what it says in our scripture. It says that she took the fruit, and she ate it, and she gave it to her husband who was with her. So here we see right at the beginning, God's given instruction, direction to the man, and, and the man does not take spiritual leadership, turns around and follows the direction his wife was leading, and, 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 and doesn't, doesn't take care of her responsibility there. So this is what's interesting though. You know, you know the story, okay, they eat the fruit, they, they uh, recognize their sin, they recognize their nakedness, and they try to hide from God. And it says this, that God came down in the cool of the day, and, and he said what? He called for Adam, called for the man. It doesn't say that God said, hey, y'all, okay? He, he, didn't say, he didn't say, hey, Eve, I saw what you did. God called to Adam, said, where are you? What's going on? God held Adam responsible, not for the sin, but for the spiritual direction of his home. And this, this issue of spiritual leadership for us as men is an important thing. Now, now again, I, 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 I'm a simple person. And spiritual leadership in my home is, is a daunting thing for me too. I've, I've spent 30 plus years trying to figure out what it's supposed to look like and how to do it effectively. I've failed more than I've succeeded as a spiritual leader. But I've, I've broken it down. I've kind of, I've finally kind of figured out. This is what spiritual leadership means to me. All right? It's basically two things. All right, guys? The first thing is this. Take initiative. All right? You might, you might want to write down there to the side. Just do something. All right? It, it doesn't have to be a big deal. I think, I think one of the things that has, has uh, caused me anxiety uh, over the years and, and, and kind of paralyzed me as, as a spiritual leader is I, I thought that spiritual leadership needed to be this, this big deal. And I remember times when we would try to have some devotionals and I would try to teach my kids things and, and uh, you know, there's really, you know, big theological terms and stuff that I barely understood. And, and I remember after one of those times, it was, it was a total train wreck, you know, and the kids laughed and I, I was really discouraged. And, and Lori said to me, Jimmy, we, we don't need you to, to be a theologian. We, we just need you to take the lead. And, and this is what I've learned, okay? The, the leader is simply the guy that goes first. 
Right? I, I love I love hiking. I love getting out on the trail. And I and if you know the leaders, this is the guy that's just I'm I'm gonna head down the trail. Come on with me. And so it's, if I'm gonna be the spiritual leader in my home, it just means I, I'm gonna get up in the morning. I'm gonna spend time in God's word. I'm, I'm gonna share with my family what's going on in my life. Here's here's some things I'm struggling with. Here's some things God's teaching me. And just just it doesn't have to be a big deal. Alright? The, the the first and simplest step. It's just, just pray with your wife. Pray with your family. Make a commitment to say, we're going we're to pray about things as they're coming along in, in our life. Make that commitment to pray together. It can be that simple in order to be a spiritual leader in your home, guys. But just do something. Have intentional conversations. Sometimes it is, it is as, as simple. Our kids were, were little. We just got like a little kid's devotional book. And we would get that out at supper time. We would just read the page from that. Sometimes it didn't even make any sense, but it, would, but it might start a, a spiritual conversation. Or, or driving down the road, just, you know, hanging out and talking about what God was doing in our lives. And uh, just, just start that. Uh, so, so the first step in this process is take initiative, do something. And the second step in the process is simply this. Don't quit. All right, listen. I, I don't know whether you got the guys in this, in this church, but I know this. Every one of us can do those two things. All right? No matter where you are in your spiritual walk, you can just do something. You can start something. You can pray with your wife. And the second thing is, um, just determine that you're not going to quit. You're, you're not going to give up. I, I think one of the things that has held me back for years is, is, is just that. That was, um, Lori was reading a book a while back, and, um, and uh, she read this part to me, and I was like, okay, i got to read me and let me have that, because I can relate to this guy. It says, uh, years ago, I was challenged to pray with my wife every day. At that time, I rarely prayed with her. Sure, we'd say grace over a meal, but as far as holding hands and stuff, no way. For some reason, I'd rather sign up for military service, go climb a cliff, or hang glide. But pray with my wife, it scared me stiff. The main reason it scared me was that I had not done it in so long to ask her to pray would be a stark admission of my failure in this area. Plus, she might have a heart attack. <laughs> I still remember the first time I asked her. We were going to bed and had our little requisite right, goodnight kiss. Scared to death, I reached over my left hand and I asked, do you want to pray? And you know what she said? She said, sure. Then she prayed and then I prayed and I lived. And listen, we laugh at that, but I relate to that guy because sometimes God will come along and say, hey, Jimmy, you know, you, you've kind of gotten off track, off course with, with the, you know, being involved in your family, this, you know, particular, some, maybe something a routine we used to have or something, something we used to do together. And, and, and then God's whispering in my ear and I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, you're right. And, and uh, but, you know, before I can act on that, the, the, the enemy is saying to me, Jimmy, if, if you go back to Lori, and say, hey, honey, I'm, I want to start praying together again. Or, or, you know, we need to start doing this together as a family. Whatever. There's, she's just going to look at you and go, here we go again. You know? And I, I remember one time sharing that with Lori, just out of, you know, frustration with, with you know, my lack of leadership. And she said, Jimmy, I, I don't know a woman anywhere who would think that. Everybody I know would only be glad to know that you're you're trying and you're committed and you're not going to give up on this. And uh, I came across this uh, this quote by uh, Winston Churchill a couple years ago. It says this: "Success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm." And when I read that, that was encouraging to me. You know why? Because I have a great track record in the first part of that. All right, going from one failure to another, I got that part down. If, if this, the, uh, the definition of success simply means that I'm just not going to give up. And when I do fail, I'm going to get back and I'm going to keep trying. And I'm not going to lose my enthusiasm and my passion and my desire to, um, to be the spiritual leader in my home. I can do that. And, and so can every one of you. And um, back, this kind of comes full circle. Back up what we talked to the ladies about, guys. Um, that, that issue that Lori talked about, that, that financial decision that we were making, the thing that she didn't know was in that process, I, I've been praying about it. God, God was leading me 
in the direction that I was trying to take our family. And so I, in my, in my heart and mind, I knew I was, I was following what I believed God was saying. The problem was, I wasn't praying with Lori about it. I wasn't sharing with her, hey, this is what God's showing me and where we need to go. I was just making a decision and going on my own way. If I had been the spiritual leader in my home, if I had been praying with my wife about this decision, it, it would have made it a whole lot easier for her to line up and say, okay, all right, God, if that's where you're leading us, I'm with Jimmy, and we're going to do this together. That's why the spiritual leadership thing is such an important thing for us as men. So, here's your homework tonight, all right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to seem really easy, but it might be a little bit of a challenge. I want you to pray together tonight, all right? I want you to pray together, husband and wife. Maybe just gather the kids up before you go home and flip the TV on or, or uh, start, you know, getting ready for bed. Just gather everybody up together and just say, hey, you know what? Um, uh, I, want us, I want us to pray together. And uh, let's make that a, a pattern. The next, uh, uh, well, how many days are we still together? Eight days, something like that? The next day, eight days, just, just commit. We're going to pray together every night as a family. Let's see what that does for uh, the spiritual temperature of our home. Let's have a word of prayer, and, uh, and we'll move on with the rest of the service. Father, thank you again for uh, the things you're showing us and teaching us with regard to uh, our relationships, with regard to our, our home, and, and uh, the things you want uh, to teach us and show us. Lord, I, I just ask you, with, uh, again, uh, help us. Thank you so much for the encouragement last night about, um, about the, um, the issue of grace. And that you have given us the, uh, everything that we need um, to live this godly life that you call us to. And uh, we have, uh, in, in your grace, we can find the desire, we can find the power uh, to live in accordance with your word. So Lord, would you help us uh, as, as men, as we seek to be the spiritual leaders in our home, that we would say, God, I need you. I need you to help me to, to have the courage. I need you to help me to have the humility that it takes to be the spiritual leader in my home. And, and as ladies, to say, God, I, I, I need you. I need you to help me to, to line myself up under um, the, the, the authority of, of, um, of someone who thinks differently than me and, and uh, has a different way of, of um, doing things. And God, help us um, ultimately, the, the purpose in all of this, not just so that our homes would go smoother and we'd, we'd be a happy place, but God, we'd be able to make you look good as people look at us and see how we, we live together and function together as a home that we would uh, allow people to see you as you really are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the students are going to come back in here in a minute, so go ahead and uh, stand and join us as we, uh, as we sing. Oh, thank you.
know that all the darkness the light from getting through Do you wish that you could see all it
and is worthy not just in that setting, but today in our hearts of all glory and honor and power and praise. Yet, I, I, I could go through my entire day and not stop and acknowledge how, how unworthy I am and how worthy He is. Just take a moment right now. That's God my soul. God, I want to praise you tonight that you, you are in charge. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of honor and power. I, I want to give you glory in my life. Not just now, but as I leave, as I walk through my day, you are worthy. Just talk to him right now. Personalize that. You're on our table. Exercise 
we, got, we talked about this last night, you have what you have. And here's the, the fourth principle. On that page, there are some blank lines there at the bottom of the page of number four. I'd like you to start writing down on those blank lines a list of all your material possessions. Now you're not going to hand this in, it's not the church treasury, but just for your sake, just write down there on those lines every material possession that has trusted you. So you might write down the how, I'm not talking about nine socks or seven forks or whatever, but, but in categories, teens you did this, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, um, so you put down socks, bonds, real estate, mutual funds, um, cars, houses, um, watches, phones, computers, whatever, whatever God has trusted you. Start making a list, you may not get it all done here in the next few minutes, but maybe tonight you can take time to finish it. One of the first four or five things that come to your mind that you own, a hunting rifle, <coughs> Shoes, uh, jewelry, whatever is important to you, or just whatever you own, start making your own list. Everybody make your list. Mom, you dad, you make a list of all the material possessions that you own. We talked about this principle last night. You can finish um, writing those things down, um, even as we talk. But here's, here's the principle tonight we need to transfer the ownership of everything we have to God. So as you make that list of all those things God has entrusted to you, but then the question comes, do you own those things, or do you just manage those things? The Bible talks about us as being not the owner, but the manager. We really don't own anything. You say, how do I know if all the things that I'm writing down on my page, if God has trusted me, a boat, car, whatever, how do I know if I'm the owner or the manager? Here's how you know. The owner has the right to make the final decision. So as you think about those things, you ask yourself, okay, who decides and what to do with those things? I was, I was uh, in a meeting in Florida, and I asked him, folks to do this, and the pastor came and he said, I started writing a list of all my material possessions, and I, I wrote down a house, and I wrote down cars, and God's not sure you enumerate the cars. So I wrote down family, van, but I tried to write down family car for the next one, but it wasn't the family car, it was my car. This pastor had a, a little red Porsche that drove around. And it, it was, he had to pay a lot for it, he'd rebuild it. But it was kind of his little God. No one touched that car, no one drove that car. Kind of deal where if a leaf falls on it, you stop pulling it off, that kind of thing. And he says, I wrote that down, I realized that wasn't God's car. That was my car. And God said, I want, I want you to give me that car. He said, I had to transfer the ownership of, of my car to God. And, and um, I'm going to sell the car. You're probably tired to explain to people why your past drives a Porsche. Yeah, I'm kind of tired of explaining too. And so I, I've got some things I said here, and I transferred the ownership of that car to God. I was in Indianapolis, and a lady came and she said, I made my list, and I wrote down all my items, and I said, God, it's all yours, and I, I refinished antiques. And I had some uh, chairs in the garage I refinished, and I thought, well, I'll sell those chairs, I'll give them money in the offering. I put out the paper, and I showed up, and said, that's not really the kind of chair I wanted. As he was leaving, he looked at my living room and said, oh, that chair, how much for that chair? She said, oh, that was not for sale, that's my chair. They talked about longer. He said, really, that's the stock I was looking for, how much for that chair? She said, no, the ones in the garage for sale, when the living room was not for sale, that's my chair. He they talked a little more and said, I'll give you such and such for that chair. She said, for the third time, that was not for sale, that's my chair. She said, the third time she said that, God said to me, whose chair? Oh, that's your chair too, isn't it, Lord? See, so I've given God the chair of the garage, but not the one in the living room. I showed that some time ago in the staff meeting the next day. One of the staff guys said, I had to go home last night and give God a chair. It sits in the den. It's the most comfortable chair in the room. Faces the TV. And when I walk in the room, everybody better throw that chair because that is my chair. I throw the kids out of the chair, the dog out of the chair, the wife out of the chair. That is my chair. I went home last night and I said to my family, you know, there may be times we're in here watching a game, watching a movie, that God wants someone other than me to sit in the most comfortable chair in the room. Because that is not my chair. That is God's chair. Have you ever transferred the ownership of everything you have to God? Have you ever made a list and just said, God, I want you to know, this is not mine. This is yours. I think sometimes we're, we're hesitant to do that because we're afraid of what God might ask. So in Pennsylvania, and came and said, I said, okay, God, uh, everything's yours, what do you want me to give? And God told me to go to my gun cabinet. Oh, man, my guns. 
I start thinking, oh, God, I don't want that gun. I don't want that gun. So I got to the, the, the den, and I, I thought, God, so I thought to myself, what if God wants all my guns? I, I stood there at the den door, and I looked at the gun cabinet, and I said, God, it's all yours. If you want me to sell every gun I have, I'll give it to you. It's all yours. So God just kind of brought a, a peace to my heart. I walked up there, and I said, I don't want all your guns. I just want you to be willing to do that. But I do want something in the back of the gun cabinet. He's like a little drawer in there. I could put money in. I said, go on a trip someday or something. I opened that. I had like $800 in that little drawer. He was happy to get his $800. He didn't have to give one of his guns. But have you ever transferred the ownership of the gun cabinet? Everything in money. Like, like 20 or something. <laughs> Some people don't have money. You have 20? 10? Anything? 100,000? <laughs> Not a credit card to get that. It's this. Let's take one. That's what it is. One's one. That's good. What's your name right here? On the edge. William. I'm going to take this, William, and you just give that to me. Okay? <laughs> Maybe you want to skip something. Not to his son, I know! Now, was that hard to do? Pretty simple, right? You know what? It's very easy to give other people's money away. Isn't that right? I mean, that, is, that is simple. There is no problem in giving other people's money away. And here's the deal. Once we transfer ownership and realize it's not ours, it becomes very simple. Have you ever transferred the ownership of our vision have to go? Let's bow our heads. Just take a few moments. Even that list <coughs> you've jotted down. Just go through each item and say, God, this is not mine. I am, I am simply the manager. You are the owner. If you want to keep this, I'll keep it. If you want to give it, I'll give it. I am acknowledging your ownership. And I just want to be good steward. You show me what to do, and I will obey. You take a moment to realize that, they will come and pray in his heart, and we'll continue on his service.
want to give you everything. All you need to do is give me all that you are. And tragically, he just walked away. And so, God, we, we as your people, we bow before you tonight together. We bow as a, as a, as a sign of our submission to the truth of your word, to the call of your word. Because it, it's life giving, it's transformative, and it opens up the floodgates and it throws open the door to your glory. And so, God, we're thankful for your word. But when your word calls us to transfer ownership of everything that's in our hands to you, which is the right thing to do, that's correct, that's what's true. Oh God, let us not experience the tragedy as individuals or as a church, as a people. Withholding from you what is due. That's what it means to acknowledge your worth and your glory <clears throat> is that we surrender everything. And in that, oh God, you're not trying to take something from us. You're trying to give us the very best thing God, make us like the, the man in the story that Jesus told. That when he found the thing of greatest possession, the pearl of great price, he was glad to sell everything. To have the thing that money couldn't buy. Well, the man who found treasure in the field sold everything. God, we want to transfer. All that we are to you. And God, my prayer is that, that in this area and in every other area, God, I think that you're teaching me as an individual and you're teaching us as a church and giving us this beautiful opportunity as a church to step fully into the call of Christ. That your desire is to be Lord over everything. God, forgive me and forgive us as a people for constantly talking ourselves out of your lordship. As though it's just too much to ask or we have a better way or just some kind of compromise. That makes your lordship a little more <clears throat> comfortable for us. It makes our souls sick. It robs us of all the fruits of the spirit. It, it eliminates our ability to make you look good and as a result of lost in our midst, cannot see Jesus. So you are worthy of our everything. It is it's a it's a, it's a call and I can feel it now in my own life and I can feel it in this room. It's a call that we resist. Not because of your glorious capacity to care for and provide for and lead us in Jesus. We resist because we don't believe the word. So God, help us in our unbelief. Give us the joy of seeing what happens. When, when an entire church gives you everything. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Take your Bible if you have one there. Turn with me to the 103rd Psalm. When we talk about the, the greatness of God this evening, and I want us to look at this Psalm of David for the team sings. Stand together with me as we look at this. It's a very familiar psalm, perhaps to you. Bless the Lord of my soul, all is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul, and, and forget not his benefits, who pardons all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your ears with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
The Lord performs righteous deeds and judges all who are oppressed. And then right in the middle of this discourse on the greatness of God, he takes a little rabbit trail, a little history lesson, verse 7. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. Then he jumps back into this discourse on God. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. <clears throat> He's not dealt with us according to our sin, nor reward us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is in the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just like a father who has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days like grass. As a father of the field, it flourishes, and the wind passes over and is gone, and the place where the knowledge is no longer. The loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant, to those who remember his precepts to do them. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. I love the way it puts verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, who serve him in his will. Bless the Lord, Lord all you works of his. In all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Father, I, I, um, I, I never can read that without thinking why you want us to bless you. But we see modeled and patterned over and over in Scripture this blessing you. I, I think I, there, there's so nothing in my life that, that, that you would need at all, but, but some, for some reason you want us to, to bless you, to acknowledge you, to worship you. And, and so we say, with all that is within us, as insignificant as that seems to be, we bless you. We bless you today. And, and we, we don't want to be negligent because we, we know that if we don't cry out, the, the rocks will. How unfair would that be? So tonight, as we sing, as we learn, as we respond, as we live, would you let our life be a constant praise and blessing to you. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You sing this song, if you don't know it, it's very wordy, but it is so powerful. And, and we don't want the, the rocks to be able to do things that God has given us the privilege to do, to bless the Lord, oh my soul. You sing with me. Thank you.
You will never embrace God's will for your life. It'll look like a dead end. And the reason they don't embrace God's will, I think most believers are not following embracing God's will. It's because they don't understand the ways of God. So I want to share with you some things I'm learning about the ways of God. It, it's a study you need to embark on. How does God do the things? That, what are God's ways? The ways of man are ways of control and comfort, convenience, influence, success. We want to be served. We want to be well thought of. But the ways of God are ways of obscurity. Criticism. To be poor in spirit. Servant of deprivation. And we don't like that. How does God do is what are the ways of God? Let me give you a few of them. Number one, God does his work in sovereign ways. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 is one of my favorite Old Testament passages. The first part talks prophetically about the ministry of John the Baptist. We kind of consider ourselves a John the Baptist ministry, kind of sowing seeds of revival. I, I love verse 8. <clears throat> the word of our God stands forever. That's a great verse. Then jump down to the verse number 12. This is Isaiah 40, verse 12. He's trying to explain to these rebellious people, Isaiah the prophet, why they should obey God. He says this. It's rhetorical. But he says, let me ask you something. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Do you want to know how big God is? God holds the waters of the earth in the palm of his hand. How much water is there on the face of the earth? There are 340 quintillion gallons. Three zeros of a thousand, three more of a million, three more of a billion, three more of a trillion, three more of a quadrillion, three more of a quintillion. Three hundred forty quintillion gallons, and God holds it all in the palm of his hand. What a God! What a vast God! What an almighty God! And the point is, the God who holds the oceans of the world in the palm of his hand is big enough to take care of your life. We've got a great big God of creation, but a midget God of our everyday life. He goes on, says, who has marked the heavens by the span. How big is the universe? He says, God holds it in the span of his hand. The span is this from your thumb to your finger. That's the span. And God measures the universe inside the span of his hand. How big is our universe? <laughs> we have no idea. It's 600 sextillion miles, we're told. What is that? I can't comprehend that. So, so instead of measuring light years, that's how light, far light travels in a year. Light travels 106,270 miles per second. You snap your fingers, and that much time, by the travel of the earth, seven and a half times, that quick. At, at the speed of light, it takes you about nine minutes to get to the sun. It's 93 million miles away. And if you're traveling at the speed of light, nine minutes to, to the sun, the next closest star, it would take you 40 years at the speed of light. To get outside of our galaxy, the light of a galaxy, it would take you 100,000 years at the speed of light. We're told our universe that we know of is 15 billion light years across. And God holds it in the span of his hand. What a God. What a vast God. What an almighty God. I've written in my Bible, and Abby wrote it for tonight or tonight. It's absurd to offer the God of the universe your advice rather than your worship. Why are we giving God advice? Most of us, our prayer life is giving God a to-do list. Why would we give the God of the universe our advice? Give him your worship. He goes on and says, uh, rhetorically, verse 13, Who is directed the Spirit of the Lord? I, I mean, who taught God? Who directed God? Who did he seek counsel from? Who informed God? Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? I didn't sit there one day and say, hmm, never thought about that. That's never happened to God. No one informs God. With whom did he consult? Who gave him understanding? Verse 14. Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? Who informed him the way of understanding? No one! They're rhetorical questions. Behold, verse 15, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. I'll tell you, we think as Americans we're pretty important. Let me tell you something. We are not God's chosen people. God does not need America. And it would be 
well-deserved privilege to wipe us off the map. And if he did, everything that would go on in God's economy would continue out of America. The nations are a drop in a bucket, a speck of dust on God's scale. The earth, the earth weighs six sextillion metric tons. And it's just a speck of dust on God's scale. He puts us in perspective about verse 22. He who sits upon the circle of the earth, his inhabitants are like grasshoppers. That's us. We're the grasshoppers. That's speaking too much about us. He goes on, look at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. Who are these one is host by number? He calls them all by name? Are you kidding? He calls them all by name? How many stars are there? We live in this galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy. There are a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. We used to think that's all there was, but a guy named Hubble came along and invented this telescope, and now we're told there's a hundred billion galaxies, but there are a hundred billion stars. How much is a hundred billion times a hundred billion? I think it's the national debt, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me see how many that is. If every person on the face of the earth approaching eight billion, if every person on the face of the earth had a million volume library, Eric, do you have a million volumes in your library? I only have five in mine for a color again. But if, if, if every person had a million volume library, every, every person in China, every person in Indonesia, Asia, every, Texas, all those foreign countries, if, if every person in the, in the world had a million volume library, every book as thick as a Webster's dictionary. Envision that? That many books, eight billion, and, and, and all that thick, times a million, with how many pages in a Webster's dictionary, there would still not be enough pages of paper to write the names of a hundred billion times a hundred billion stars. And God calls them all by name. I've got six kids, I can't keep their names straight. How does God do it? He's God. And, and why would we then sit here and tell God what to do to jump through our room? How, how ridiculous is that? Listen, I, I can't explain to you all that God does, but if I knew everything God knows, I would not question anything that God does. But I don't know everything God knows. And you know what? God does not have to explain to C. Canfield how he runs his universe. He doesn't have to explain that to you either. But we sit there and say, God, if you, if you tell me why this has happened, why you're doing this, why did, then, then maybe I'll obey you, maybe I'll follow you. God does not owe anyone an explanation. He's God. He can do everyone. He is God. We are not. And I'm okay with that. And until you come to that place where you realize that God does His work in sovereign ways, you're not going to go any farther in your life. And our world can't handle that. We want to be our own God. There was a video years ago, Shirley McLean was trying to enlist people in the New Age movement. Her little guru was saying to her, Shirley, you are God. We're all God. We just forgot we were God. <laughs> what kind of God forgets God? That, that's the, anyway, that's it. And you just have to believe you're God. She says, okay, I believe I'm God. He said, you really have to believe it. Okay, I, I believe I'm God. You really have to believe it. So in this video, she's down by the ocean. Some of these three or forty quintillion gallons are splicing all over the rocks. And the music swells. And she looks up at heaven and she says, I am God! Frank Perez says, can't you imagine God? You can go to the front page of heaven and say, Michael, what is that down there? I am God! And the Bible says God sits in the heaven and laughs. It's kind of one of those times, doesn't it? When this little mortal woman is shaking her fist for claiming herself to be God, and we say it's so ridiculous. But most of us live our life. We are practical atheists. We claim that we believe in the God of the universe, but we live our life running it ourselves, telling God what to do. Don't give God advice. Give Him your worship. He does not have to explain to you. He is God. I am not, and I'm okay. And until you embrace the sovereignty of God, you're not going farther in your life. Has it ever occurred to you that it may not be God's explanation that is incomplete, but our ability to comprehend it? How do you explain to a child how electricity operates? She understand that my, my daughter Anna when she was little, she'd be crawling toward an electric outlet. And I say, Anna, I was in this wall, there's electricity. 
And if you put your finger in that plug, then it's going to hurt you. So don't not play. Don't play around the socket. She's three. She can understand electricity. I see her doing it again. What do I do? I spank her. Why? Because I don't like her. No, I don't want to be some crispy critter. I, I love the way she was. But, but how do you explain to a three-year-old electricity? How can God explain to us how he runs this universe? He doesn't have to. He is God. I am not. I'm okay with that. And you're not going to go an inch farther in your walk until you embrace it. I, I've spent too much time there. Here's the second. God does his work in sudden ways. In sudden ways. Hebrews 12, 26 says, Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Ever feel like God was, was taking you by the angles, holding you upside down, and just shaking loose everything in your life? He'll do that. He'll shake everything in your life loose and, and until all is left is Jesus. Now, we live here, you live here in the, uh, in the south, and y'all have, uh, have tornadoes, right? And, and in the tornadoes, there's, there's uh, warnings and watches, right? Which is worse? Warning. Warning. The warning, the warning. I grew up in Oregon, you know, it didn't make sense to me. And then she watches the weather, and, and there's warning to watch, and it seems to me that the, the warning should be, it's coming, and then watch out, there it is. And I, I, I can't, I, I can never understand what it does. But, but we were in California some time ago, and uh, I was preaching, and, and we were in Southern California, and, and had some time off, and went to this little outlet place, and an earthquake hit. That's what we have on the West Coast, earthquake. There, there's no warning. There's no watch. We're in this store, all the walls start shaking, guys grab Debbie, pull her under a counter, and, and we wear it up. That's the way sometimes God works in us. It's in the suddenness of, of the event, the squeeze, the thing. We, there was no more and no watch. It just happens. And God does his work in those ways. So when those times happen, what are you going to do? Are you going to throw in the towel and say, God, what are you doing? Now listen, at some point, we're going to get through. And let's say you get home tonight. You stand at your front door, and let's say there's a blackout over the whole state. Let's say it's cloudy night, so there's no light from the sun, from the moon, the stars, and that your phone's not working. So you stand at the front door of your house, it's pitch black. Could you find the flashlight in your house? Probably most of you didn't. Let's say you keep it in that kitchen, that third door down. So you stand at the front door, pitch black. But you live it long enough to know I walk, and you might bump into a few walls, but, but you know that the ladder in your house, and you, you walk down a hall, you might hit a few things, but pretty much you, you know the pattern. And you, you come into the kitchen, and there, there's total, total black. But there, there, there's that island deal, and you reach down there, you pull that door out, and you pull up the flies out. What did you do? You applied in the dark what you had learned in the light. And that's what you do. But these days, these are days of light. Every time the pastor opens his book, it, it's light. And so, so when, the, when the dark comes, don't say, God, where are you? Apply in the dark what you learn in the light. Spurgeon said it this way. Learn to trust the heart of God even when you can't see the hand of God. See, the children of Israel, all they knew was the hand of God. And if God wasn't handing them what they want, wasn't jumping through their hoop, doing what they wanted, then they got all upset. But Moses knew the heart of God. And, and because he knew the ways and the heart of God, he could go through times where there was no water or where the Red Sea came, whatever it was. And, and God does his work in those sudden ways. So sometimes the, the suddenness of a crisis, he uses that to kind of flesh out the real us. In Matthew 14, Peter's walking on the water. Well, he sees Jesus. They're in a storm, right? And he jumps out of the boat to walk on the water. In the midst of obedience to Christ, I mean, they were told to get in the boat and go. They're obeying Christ. In the midst of obedience to Christ, they experience their greatest storm. Think of that for a minute. They were obeying, and the great... He said, well, I'm not obeying God. Why do I have this problem or that problem? In the midst of the greatest storm, greatest obedience, they have this storm. And, and, and in this storm, for a while, they, they couldn't see Christ. And then all of a sudden, he, he appears. And Peter sees him, and he steps out of the boat and starts walking on the water. Listen, it's more important that, that God can see us than that we can see God. And, and Jesus knew they were there. And so Peter starts walking on the water, and as long as he kept his eyes on Christ, everything was fine. But all of a sudden, he started looking at the storm. Like, what in the world am I doing? 
That the, the focus of your eyes determines the strength of your feet. And the focus of his eyes, when it was on Christ, was okay. When his eyes are on the storm, all of a sudden he starts sinking. And in, in the midst of those crises, God is going to show us something and teach us something. And I'm going to learn some things. But God does his work in those sudden ways. And many times, God, God shakes our little personal world. What's he doing? God often has to tear down before he can build up. And, and a lot of times, we just don't like that. The, the, the purpose of God in shaking us is not our destruction. It's so he can make a permanent building. And God does his work in some ways. This one kind of goes hand in hand. He does his work in silent ways. We, we want to hear God make a big noise. I found this. We, we miss the supernatural looking for the spectacular. What church is making the biggest noise, the biggest show? Elijah wanted to see God and a strong wind came in the first kings and God wasn't in this one in the wind. An earthquake came and God wasn't in the earthquake. A fire came and God wasn't in the fire. And then God came in a still, small voice. You know, sometimes the heavens just seem shut up to us. Earl Lutzer was the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois. Was a good friend of our ministry. He was sharing with us one time, and I'm gonna forget this. He said, "Never interpret the silence of God as the indifference of God." But there's a lot of times where God is silent, but God is never indifferent to us. Never interpret the silence of God as the indifference of God. God, God is always alert, always there, and as a promise, we want to see some some great big noise. But the question is not can I see the invisible God? It's can I trust? invisible God. The Puritans talked about going through seasons of life where they were in the dark night of the soul. Where they, they would try to pray and they couldn't get through it. But they didn't stop. Even though God was silent, it's one of his ways. If you understand one of the ways of God is silence, then when things get silent, you don't stop. You keep on praying. You keep on trusting. You keep on obeying. It's one of the ways of God. If you understand that, then when, when things go silent momentarily, you throw in the towel. But if you know the ways of God, you keep on going. Here, here's one more. I don't like this one. God does his work in suffering ways. I'll share with you the message next week. Uh, just some things that dead there we're going through, some, some suffering things that we've been walking through with one of our kids, and, and, and just some lessons we're learning. I, I don't like that, but, but the ways of God are the ways of the cross. And if you understand that, that when things start getting difficult, not going your way, you're going to give up. The, the, the greatest struggle in my life is to die what I want and accept what God wants. Paul said in Galatians 4, 16, God forbid that I should glory. Save in the cross of Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you're going to glory in? My own Lord is crucified in me. And I am the Lord. Listen, the cross is a place of death. At the cross, you're totally in the hands of someone else. And, and the, the ways of God are the ways of the cross. That the ways of the cross are always of temptation. Jesus went through temptation. Satan said, you can have your glory now. And Satan's going to offer you that same thing. The ways of the cross are, are, are ways of misunderstanding and loneliness. Listen, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to establish yourself. You don't have to toot your own horn. You toot his own horn and his battery down. And, and, and some of us have done that. I, I'd like to congratulate some people and give a pat on the back with their hands always in the way. And, and, and some of us are like that. This not, I found this among most of us. We don't mind suffering as long as everyone knows we're suffering. We want to advertise. It's like the Pharisees, when they would fast, they would contort their faces, they wouldn't shave, they would kind of shuffle around. People said, oh, what's happening with you? I'm fasting. Jesus said, you fast, shave, take a shower, don't tell anybody. And what you do in secret, God will reward openly. We want to announce it to everybody. Uh, sometimes it's, it's just lonely. The ways of the cross are ways of obedience. The, the, they're ways of humiliation. It says in Philippians 2 7 of Jesus, he made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself, made himself of no reputation. There's a little mantra that I heard years ago. I, I can't say it's true of me. In fact, I don't even like to say it because it's too convicting. But it goes like this. 
It's, it's a, a little prayer. Make me a little and unknown, loved and prized by God alone. Is that your heart? Make me a little and unknown, loved and prized by God alone. Would that be okay with you? If it was only God who knew all the things you do? That's not the way most of us live. Jesus made himself of no reputation. They didn't take it from him. The, the ways of the cross are ways of death. You don't walk away from a crucifixion. You're carried away. And the principle of the cross is this. It's a total willingness to fall to the ground and die. Except the free free fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But what's that brain? That little curl goes to the ground. I never understood that for a long time. I said, how, how does something die? It's to bring life. I read a book by Watts Whitney called The Release of the Spirit years ago. And he explained how, how that curl goes to the ground. The whole thing doesn't die. It's just that hard outer shell rots away. And then the life inside can be released. And when the heart out of shell of self dies, but the life of Christ on the inside can be released. But that seed goes in the ground, it's buried, <clears throat> covered, out of sight, never to be seen again. Is that okay with you? It's the ways of the cross. Now, you need to continue and think through some things about God's ways. As you begin to understand God's ways, then you'll be able to embrace His will. Here's a couple things about the will of God. The will of God is always purposeful, though it may seem inconvenient. In Acts 16, we read the story of Paul and Silas, and here they are out preaching, and they're, they're arrested. That they're put in prison. That was illegal. Paul was a Roman citizen. So he's unjustly arrested, illegally imprisoned. They put him in the lowest part of the dungeon, the rats running around, bunch of their wounds, the stench of human dung all around. And here he is at the eeriest part of night, 12 o'clock midnight. Was Paul in the will of God, yes or no? Yes or no? Was it convenient? No. No. But the will of God is not always convenient, but there is a great purpose in that. Paul said in Philippians 1, my circumstances have fallen out from the furtherance of the gospel. He was in prison there, we call them prison epistles. He said the whole Praetorian Guard has heard of Christ. The Praetorian Guard was 5,000 men. They rotated around being chained to Paul. Talking about a captive audience. And many of them came to Christ. He said, right now, the best place for me to glorify God is in this prison situation. Chained to these prisoners. He said in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I, I gladly let this thorn in the flesh have me so the power of God can rest upon me. I don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. But he had something. He embraced those things. God never calls us to inconvenience without a purpose. The will of God is always beneficial, though it may seem uncomfortable. No one had a more uncomfortable day than Job. I was just reading this through again recently, and, and you all know the story of Job. I was struck again in, in, that, in the first chapter, as it says, the servant came in and said, all of your camels were destroyed. The servant killed. I alone escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, the next guy comes in and says, you know, you know all those caveats, they're all gone too. All the servers said, I alone escaped. And while he was yet speaking, so those are just, and there was a fire, and it burned all your crops, you have no more possessions. And while he was yet speaking, five times, and the last one, all of his children died. In one Sunday, in one day, and, and it came, one day they finished saying something when the next guy came in. Talk about inconvenient. And we go through this whole story of Job, and his friends come and say, Well, you must be a horrible person. And finally, we, we know the story of God. Is, and, and all this that's happening in Job, we see God and Satan having this dialogue. And you know, Job never saw that. All heaven and hell was watching Job's lips. Is, is, is he going to curse God and die? Like his wife said? What did he say? The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not with his lips. How could he do that? Because he knew the ways of God. So he could embrace the will of God. And, and just think how his life has benefited the church for thousands of years. How his story has encouraged that he never saw that happening. He, he didn't see the battle in the heavens. 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 17, this momentary light of affliction is working a far more eternal way of glory. All things work together for good than the love of God and call upon his purpose. I, I think sometimes we resist God's will because we don't like the restrictions. We don't, we don't like anybody telling us what to do. Job 24 13 says, Some rebel against the light. They don't want to know its ways. I want to tell you something. Sometimes the will of God is restrictive. There are things that you're not going to be able to do and so forth. And, and, and we don't want that because we want to be our own boss. We want to be in charge. How restrictive was it for Christ to be confined to a human body? To go through his life and what, what about the, the God of the universe who's spoken in existence, not confined to, to human flesh and, and human language? G. Adams says, when, when is a train the most free? When it's on the tracks or off the tracks? What's the answer? On the tracks. If, if that train says, I'm tired of going on the same tracks, it's too restrictive, I'm going to go to this cornfield. And so it takes life and jumps off the tracks and heads down the cornfield, it'll be about one car fall over. You see, every bondage has a corresponding freedom, and every freedom has a corresponding bondage. You can be free from your toothbrush and a slave to cavities, or you can be a slave to your toothbrush and free from cavities. Every freedom has a corresponding bondage, every bondage has a corresponding freedom. And when there is the willingness to be restricted, there is great liberation that comes in that, in Christ. But if we say, I'm going to be my own boss, and you live in the bondage of self, you're going to be in trouble. And, and we don't want anyone telling us what to do. Tozer said, God has nothing to say to the frivolous man. And, and, and the problem is, let me say something. If, if, if there is no peace in your life as a believer, it's probably because you've not accepted the restrictive will of God in your life. And then, it's always rewarding what God is, though it may be momentarily costly. Flip over to one passage, Hebrews chapter 11, one of my favorite New Testament passages. Hebrews 11 is like Sunday school on steroids, right? I mean, it's all these incredible um, stories of these incredible heroes of, of, of the faith, and, and, and it just goes through their, um, their, their journey and their life, and Abraham and Sarah, Sarah and Isaac, and and so forth. And then, toward the end of Hebrews 11, it gets to a, just another list. And I don't know I, I, I have a high adventure quotient. And I, I, I love, it says in verse 32, what more should I tell? For time will fail and tell me Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah, and David, Samuel, and the prophets. I love this next couple of verses. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword. sword. I love sword fighting movies. I want to be in the sword fighting group. From weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received their death back by resurrection. I want to stop right there. I want to be in the sword fighting group. I want to show my faith by shutting the mouths of lions. But I don't stop there. Others were tortured, not accepting their deliverance. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, put to death with the sword. They went about the sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. Were they in the will of God, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. And it was costly for them. Tozer said this, God never used some men greatly until he's hurt him deeply. That's not inspired, but... I think it's true. And, and so many of us say, I, I, I'm not going to really go through those things. It's some of the will of God for some of us to go through seasons like that. And it's okay if you understand the ways of it, you can embrace those times. And let me just say, in the midst of whatever cost of thing you're going through, God always holds out the promise of reward. He knows we need to see the value of what we're pursuing. And He wants to know that even our suffering has a purpose. Matthew 19, Peter says to Jesus, what are we going to receive since we've left everything to follow you? And think Jesus would say, just do it because I said to. That's not what he said. He said, everyone who follows me will receive many times on this earth and on top of that eternal life. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. There's going to be difficulty. It cost Joseph 
years of his life. It cost Paul his future, his prestige, his family. It cost humility his life. Amy Carmichael, a good missionary, said, Can he have followed far who has no wound or scar? There's going to be difficult times, no doubt. And, and then the will of God is always sufficient, but man invisible. What do I mean by that is God will always provide everything you need to do what He calls you to do. My, my own life was to coach basketball. I, I went to Bible college, but, but I, was, I was there to play the sports. And, and when I came to this ministry, life action, I, I was not headed to do anything other than just have an enjoyable life. I learned first, Matthew 6, 33. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things be added unto you. Now, it's God's will for some people who coach basketball. That wasn't, that wasn't God's will for me. And I wouldn't pray what I'm doing for a basketball coaching job in the nation. God is something that and God has provided everything Debbie and I have needed to do what God's called us to do. And, and God's will, whatever it is for you, he will always supply everything you need to all these calls you do. Now, there's one more. I wish we didn't have to add this last one. We should just stop right here. There's one more. The will of God is always the best path, but it's normally ignored. It's always best. But for some reason, because we've not understood the ways of God, when we look at the will of God, and it seems too hard, no fun, too much stuff, and so, so we ignore God's will. And, and my contention is we ignore God's will because we don't really know the ways of God. We've not really trusted His sovereignty. We've not really seen He does things through suffering and in silence. And, and, and suddenly in our life, and so we resist what God wants. And we don't obey Him. I was on a meeting time ago, and Pastor Sherry was uh, that day with his insurance agent. He said, um, I have to get to the church, we're having a meeting at our church, and the agent said, Who's the person meeting with? He said, Life action, so I know life action. He came to my church 13 years ago. He said, um, I've been having an affair. Six months prior to coming, I, I stopped that affair, and God just really worked in my life, and I broke it off, and we got to know this meeting, and God was working in my heart about honesty, and on a Sunday, God just said to me, I've, I've prepared your wife. You need, you need to go to her and tell her what you've done, and ask her to forgive you, so that so you can not do it in the future, and, and, I, and she will forgive you. She just heard all these messages of, of forgiveness and love and so forth, and she, she's read right, and, and, and you can do it. So I took her by the hand and went back to her room, and I took it out. She said, hey, what, what, what do you want? She said, he says, awesome, I'm going to pray for you. Didn't tell me. Team left, and a few months afterwards, my wife found out about my affair, but not from me, from another source. She was irate. And we had a rocky year, and after a year, she divorced me. He said to my pastor friend, he said, that was 13 years ago. He said, I think if I would have obeyed God when he told me to, I still didn't know it right now. The will of God is always, always, always best. But we ignore it because we understand the ways of God. Now, you have a piece of paper there that you're given. If you don't have one, some of our team members will grab one. If you have something, so if you're right with from everyone to take one, here's how you're close tonight. I want you to take that blank sheet of paper out of the shadow. And I want you to write a letter. A letter to God. And here's how I'd like you to start your letter. Dear God, I believe in your sovereign. And tonight, I choose to trust you with. And I want you to think that through and tell God right now. God, I believe you're sovereign. And, and, and here, because I believe that, here are the things that, that I, I've looked at and I've, I've been holding up my hoop saying, God, do this, do that. But I'm letting go of those things. I'm going to trust you with. And you write down all those things that you have been having a hard time trusting God with. And tonight, do business with God and say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. It's helpful to put it down in print. It's a letter. I'm going to tell you how you can deliver it in just a minute. So take some moments. Take it seriously. God, I believe you're sovereign. 
tonight, I choose to trust you with you with the letter of God. all the time you finish that. Once you're through, fold them out. We can make a front of the auditorium here just the mailbox. Just fold them in half and come down in front and just pause here a few moments and deliver here on the platform somewhere in the place across. And take a few moments and pray and do business with God and say, God, here's, here's my heart under your feet. You're sovereign. I'm trusting you with these things. And take a moment and do business with God. You're God, I'm not, and I'm okay with that. Just so leave your letter. This will be the post office. It's got a puncture card. You do that, and you're finished. You just look out. We'll see you back tomorrow. Put it in there. 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 Put it in